Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at aaronv.com. You're listening to episode 101 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're answering more weird questions. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. So, Jimmy, what are we going to be hearing about today? Well, we're going to have quite a number of weird questions. We're going to be hearing about whether actors who get baptized on stage are really baptized. We're going to be talking about what the Our Father, Hail Mary, and Glory Be would sound like if France had never conquered England and we were still speaking a language based on Anglo-Saxon only. We're going to talk about Tolkien's elves and whether they would require sacraments. Can you say mass in Klingon? Where did Jesus's Y chromosome come from? How long my beard is and how long it took to grow it? Something people ask surprisingly often. Whether (laughs) Catholics can be Jedis? Can zombies be saved? Are they biblical? And uh, what about those saints who rose when Jesus was crucified? Do we know anything about them? What's the point of liturgies where pets are blessed? What would happen if you if you genetically edited an embryo to change its sex? And did Jesus laugh? Wow, interesting. Uh, if I, if I remember that painting, <laughs> the famous painting of Jesus laughing, uh, that's a good question. All right, yeah. so uh, let's turn it over to uh, you and Cy Kellett for the answers to these weird questions. Uh, we welcome Jimmy Aiken. First of all, Jimmy hey. Aiken, senior apologist here at Catholic Answers. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy. Uh, and uh, Jimmy's latest book, by the way, Teaching with Authority, uh, How to Cut Through Doctrinal Confusion and Understand What the Church Really Says. Uh, and every now and then we uh, gather up enough of these weird questions that we get to have a full hour with Jimmy uh, doing weird questions oh, it, uh, with us. Supply is not the issue. So, <laughs> it's not a supply no, and demand. We've we got plenty of weird questions. we got plenty of weird questions. <laughs> um, Jason asked this okay. via email. Uh, do you say via or via? How do you say? Tomato, Some, tomato. Uh, really? Potato, potato? I say via, but... Do you say via? Yeah. All right. Jason asked the following question via email. Uh, I was watching a sitcom on one of the major networks. In this particular episode, a teenage character was trying to win over a girl by pretending to be as religious as she was. Okay. Been there. Done that. The female character had made a decision to be baptized in a Baptist church, and the young man joined her, hoping that the gesture would garner her affections. The pastor, character, dunked both of the teenagers in the font and recited the proper Trinitarian form. Mm -hmm. Now, even though they were acting on a set, it seems to me that all of the necessary requirements were fulfilled for a baptism. Provided the actors had not previously been baptized, would they now be baptized? No, they wouldn't, uh, because one element that's required for baptism or any sacrament is missing from this situation. And so they may have used the proper matter. They may have used the proper form. They did not have the proper intention. Uh, Because they were pretending. That's right. Uh, The intention has to be to do, in at least a broad way, to do what the church does. So we're performing that that sacred rite that Christians do, which they call baptism. And that's not what they were intending to do here. They were simulating the sacrament. And so consequently, none of the parties involved, presumably the neither the actors nor the actor playing the minister, um, had the intention to actually do a baptism. Right. And so, so that's missing. The and- intent was not there. There's interestingly a parallel case to this in the movie um, Ed Wood. Famous Tim Burton movie. And <laughs> yeah, with Johnny Depp. Yeah, it was Black Johnny Depp. It's it's a biopic of the famous Bad Hollywood director Ed Wood yeah. made lots of movies, including the famous Plan 9 from Outer Space. Yeah. And in order to get funding for his films, uh, Plan uh, Ed Wood and his crew, his group, got baptized by a Baptist church in Hollywood. They officially became members of the church so they could get the church's funding to underwrite Plan 9. And uh, and. 
And because one of the actors was Tor Johnson, who is this huge Swedish wrestler, Uh he wouldn't fit in a normal baptistry. And so they had to use a swimming pool. And now would those have been valid baptisms, even though it it, well, it depends on uh, now in that case, the minister certainly had the intention to perform baptism. Right. The question would be, were the uh, were the. The, Ed Wood and his crew, were they intending to become Christians or not by this, to become members of this church? All right. And, of course, they had to already not already be baptized. Yeah. Um, there's a, a great line in the movie. This isn't really in keeping with the way Baptists normally administer the sacrament. But, you know, one of the baptismal promises that we as Catholics make is like, do you renounce Satan and all his glamours and stuff like yeah. that. And in the movie, the mini- Baptist minister asked that question of Bill Murray's character, the comedian Bill Murray, <laughs> yeah. who's playing a rather dissipated character with a lifestyle that is not at all in keeping with Christian morality. And the minister says, do you renounce Satan? And he says, he thinks about it a second and says, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now, when I first started reading Jason's question, I didn't think it was going to go that direction. Mm -hmm. I thought he was going to ask, like, say this is a real situation and a guy gets baptized just to impress a girl. Mm -hmm. Uh, Would the guy in that situation, would the guy be really bad? If he's intending to uh, to become a Christian by this, it would be valid. Uh It might not be fruitful in Aquinas's words. Okay, if he like didn't have an intent to really reform his life and stuff like that, if he hadn't really broken his attachment to sin. And so forth, and said, "I'm going to. Re- I want to repent of that with God's grace." Oh, so right. So the repent but it would be, part of the would be valid. Oh, ah, yeah. how interesting! All right, uh, thanks for that, uh, Jason. Uh, Pat by email. Uh, uh, first of all, any question that gets Jimmy to re- reference the movie Ed Wood is a great, <laughs> great question. <laughs> That's when I first realized that Johnny Depp was a very talented he is, comedic actor. Yeah, he's a brilliant actor. Yeah. Um, uh, Pat also via email asks as a sort of academic exercise among linguists, Mm -hmm. there's a hypothetical language, English created from a Britain isolated from Latin and French influence. What would the, our father, hail Mary and glory be sound like if Anglo-Saxon influence words were used exclusively in the prayers. Okay, so I've been aware of English for a long time. It is a constructed language. The basic idea is you take uh, you you, ex- you take normal English and you exclude from it words that would have been introduced following the French conquest of uh, England in 1066. Mm-hmm. So you pretend the Battle of Hastings never occurred, and you also eliminate uh, Latinate words, uh, which. Um, are also present. And so it's basically English, but with some substitutions. I've often commented actually here on Catholic Answers Live about how in English we have two words for almost everything because we have a basically Germanic language with Latin and French additions to it. Yeah. And so you can almost always find a Germanic root to say the same thing that we normally say with a Latin root. And actually, because it may be because prayers tend to be very traditional and they tend to rely on older vocabulary and get translated very slowly. Actually, the Lord's Prayer doesn't come out that different. There is a, a, a wiki and wiki is a Hawaiian word that means quickly, but there's a wiki online devoted to English uh, called the English moot. And they have a version of the, of the Lord's prayer, which I looked up and it I'll, I'll stress the words that are different, but it's almost the same. It goes, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into lustdom, but keep us from evil. That is only four words different. Right. Yeah. The whole thing. Yeah. Now they lustdom. Lustdom. Because there's not a word. Temptation is a Latinate word. Yeah. Um, They didn't have uh, versions of the Hail Mary or the Glory Be, but I did them. Oh, cool. So the Hail Mary, uh, according to my version, would go Hail Mary full of gift Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the bloom of your womb. 
Now, you could also say seed of your womb, but I like the rhyme between bloom and yeah. womb. Uh, blessed is the bloom of your womb. Holy Mary, Mother of God, ask for us sinners now and at the time of our death. You know, that's not that many words either. And it's, no. as you're saying, that because these are so old yeah. in the English, they, they got an English translation really early. Yeah. And, uh, and, and they persisted. Yeah. In that. And so that one's also only four words different. The glory be yeah. is only two words different. It would be, according to my version, wonder be to the father and to the son and to the Holy Ghost mm-hmm. as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be. Amen. And of course, amen is a Hebrew word, but you don't have to exclude Hebrew from English, just French and Latin. Ah, Okay. I would say starting the prayer instead of glory be, but wonder be. That's the biggest change. Yeah, because it, it, Gloria is just a straight Latin word. So glory is just bringing Gloria over into English. So you right. got to get rid of that. Wonder be the fa- wonder be to the Father. And to the, that's very. I'm, that was a weird question, and that I, that was very entertaining. Thank you very much, yeah. uh, Pat from email, um, where she lives. Uh, and we go to a question now uh, from Paul. Who asks, Jimmy, would Tolkien's elves, uh, that would be like the elves from the Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion and all those books, Mm -hmm. uh, as unfallen humans require the sacraments? So uh, when this question got asked on Facebook, there was a discussion among people about are Tolkien's elves actually unfallen? And there were different opinions on that. Um, I am not enough of a Tolkien scholar to answer that question. Well, I'm happy to help if I can, Jimmy. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I would say, though, suppose let's just go with the premise. Suppose Tolkien's elves or any other race is unfallen. Would they need the sacraments? Well, they wouldn't need it to go to heaven because they or they wouldn't need it to avoid going to hell, I should say, uh, because they're as unfallen beings, they're not going to have sins and therefore they're not going to uh, incur punishment in the afterlife, um, assuming they die Mm -hmm. in in. However, they they might die even though they're unfallen because immortality is a gift. Any natural system can and will oh. break down over time, any physical system, oh. unless it's supported by grace. And so uh, consequently, even if you're unfallen, you might die mm-hmm. and unless God's keeping you alive. The uh, and similarly, just as immortality is a gift, so is the supernatural destiny of being with God. And so Catholic theologians, and this goes back centuries, but Catholic theologians have talked about how God could have created human beings in a state um, that where they didn't have the supernatural destiny of being united with God. Mm -hmm. They could have uh, been unfallen and lived in paradise and not had the call to be fully united with God. This is kind of like the speculation about limbo. Okay. About now limbo is not church teaching, but it's a theological speculation that would hold that people who die without personal sin, but also without sanctifying grace, could like have a natural kind of paradise where they have even great natural pleasure. They just wouldn't have the supernatural happiness of being united with God. And so consequently, if we had unfallen elves or other beings, other unfallen beings, they might not have the supernatural calling for union with God. And so they might, even though they wouldn't need the sacraments to avoid going to hell, they might need the sacraments to elevate them to union with God. I see. Oh, that's boy, that uh, separates out some things that we usually have all mushed together. Yeah, this this, uh, because we are human. We think that this is the way it's supposed to be, that we have this opportunity for supernatural union with God. But But that's a gift. That's a. Wow. Didn't have to do that. You know, when you say uh, that limbo is not a teaching of the church, that really bothers me. And I feel like I wish I had a resource that would help me straighten out questions. You're about dissimulating. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> you're not really upset. <laughs> oh. You're using that. You're just you're, like, you're like those, book? those actors <laughs> on that TV doing. show. Right. Yeah, uh, because there is a book that can help you straighten out what is actually church mm-hmm. teaching. It's called Teaching with Authority, How to Cut Through Doctrinal Confusion and Understand What the Church Really Says. And, and it's by Jim. Jimmy Aiken, and, yes. And Limbo is one of the case studies in that book. Yeah. Yeah. Limbo is an interesting one. Um, 
Um, oh, Mark from email mm -hmm. asks the following. Uh, by the way, if you're like, where are these questions coming from? If you're just tuning in or something, it's weird questions with Jimmy Aiken today. So we, we, we are aware that these questions are weird. We are reveling in that weirdness. Uh, he uh, Mark says, would a mass performed in Klingon be invalid or illicit? If it is valid, where can we find a priest who could do that? Could Father Hugh be trained to do this? Well, Father Hugh is a talented guy, and even though I, ha I, he, I, I don't know that he presently speaks any language that have the intense guttural sounds that Klingon does, I'm sure he could learn them, and I would be happy to help him with he can that. Have a conversation in have, German. have to practice a lot. <laughs> yeah. It's a little harsher in Klingon than yeah. it is in German. Right. In German, it's more like... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so I would, I would assume he's he's capable of learning it. The question is, would it be valid? And this is quite interesting. The Klingon, like English, is a constructed language. So is so are others like Esperanto right. is a famous one that was constructed. It's kind of a blend of different European languages, and it was meant to be in a kind of international language. Now, there's no church teaching on this, but the church has not said that you can't have a constructed language to sell that would be valid for celebrating a sacrament. And and if you think about it, every language is a constructed language because people add words to it over time and they yeah. add grammatical forms over time. Language, I mean, look in Genesis, Adam names all the animals. Yeah. So, um, so language is a human invention and every individual language, it's normally kind of a long-term multi-century committee that yeah. comes up with a language. <laughs> right. But it's a little haphazard. Too. But it is constructed. Yeah. And so consequently, um, if you had a constructed language, there's not in principle a reason why it couldn't be used to celebrate a sacrament. Now, an, a concern that I would have is, is this language actually in use? Mm -hmm. If nobody actually speaks this language, I would have a question of, you know, is that really going to work? But if it has a community of actual language users, people who really can speak this thing, mm -hmm. then I would say, well, they're saying stuff and th and they speak this language and God knows what they mean by it. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that I couldn't exclude validity from a language, even if it's recently constructed, yeah. that has an actual language community. So like Esperanto, People I would actually speak. Yeah, Esperanto. I would assume that or English, uh -huh. um, you know, you said uh, this is my body and then no words in that that are Latinate that I can think of. Right. Um, so I would assume that it would it would be valid. And in the case of Klingon, there actually is a community of language users. People really? do learn. They translate into Klingon. I mean, like Hamlet's been translated into Klingon. It's supposed to, according to the facetiousness, it's supposed <laughs> to be better in the original Klingon. <laughs> but uh, the even parts of the Bible have been translated into Klingon. And there are people who speak it. They get together. They I, I think you can even like go to a Klingon language immersion camp to learn it. Yeah. And so there is an actual community of Klingon speakers, even though it's a constructed language. I couldn't eliminate it for validity. I could eliminate it for lyseity because you need to celebrate the sacraments in one of the languages for which translations have been approved. And there oh. is no current Klingon lectionary. So it would not be lawful to celebrate the mass in Klingon, but uh, I couldn't exclude it for validity. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for that question. It is weird questions uh, with Jimmy Aiken today on Catholic Answers Live. Uh, Fran asks, where did Jesus Y chromosome come from? Well, it couldn't have come from Mary, not without special manipulation of the DNA, because Mary, being a woman, ha would have had two X chromosomes and no Y chromosome. So either uh, in bringing about the conception of Jesus, God created a Y chromosome ex nihilo, or he uh, could have taken one of Mary's X chromosomes and modified it so it became a Y chromosome, or he could have gotten it from elsewhere. But whatever happened, it had to be an additional aspect of the miracle because women do not have X, do not have Y chromosomes.
Uh, Fran, thank you very, very much uh, for that. Um, let's Dan says, uh, asks the following, uh, Jimmy, where did Adam get his Y chromosome? Well, it depends on whether you think Adam was made directly from the dust of the ground or uh-huh. whether you think that was a symbol of uh, of God taking Adam from the material creation, even though he used prior biological forms. And if you have the view that Adam's body was taken directly from the dust of the ground, then God would have rearranged the atoms and particles from the dust to make the first y, human Y chromosome. If, though, you uh, believe in the theory of evolution, then you would say that Adam's Y chromosome came from his almost but not quite human father. Ah, I see. And, and it's a, OK. And, and the Y chromosome may or may not have been modified in that process yeah. because it's not clear that you have to have a modification in the Y chromosome. If you're an almost human, the, the, the yeah. genetic differences could have resided in other chromosomes besides the Y. So Dan follows that up with, did Eve have a Y chromosome? So I'm guessing that Dan is not uh, one who accepts evolutionary theory or just appears at well, least I for don't the purpose know. of this question. Yeah. Okay. So did Eve have a Y chromosome? Because like, she, be- she came from Adam's rib. And could that Y that was withheld from Eve had been preserved and passed down somehow until it was used, utilized in Jesus, the second Adam? Okay, so in regard to the first question, um, it, it's going to depend on what you think the origin of Eve's body was. If you right. take the uh, the view that Eve was literally taken from Adam, then from his side, then presumably uh, God would have copied Adam's X chromosome so that Eve had two X's and no Y. Because humans that have a Y chromosome, even if they have two X's, Mm -hmm. there are some people that are XXY, but it's a genetic abnormality. And when that happens, they're still like male. Okay. Um, But uh, if if Adam is a prototypical woman, she would have had two X chromosomes. Presumably, God would have just copied Adam's X chromosome. Um, On the other hand, uh, according to John Paul II, the creation of Eve from Adam's side is a symbol of the fact that men and women are equal and are of the same stock. Okay, And so it's not meant to be taken literally. In that case, uh, she also wouldn't have had a Y chromosome. She would have gotten two X's, one from her almost human but not quite mother and one from her almost human but not quite father. Um, in terms of could she have had a suppressed Y chromosome that was somehow carried down the female line connecting her to Jesus? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it would require a miracle to do that, but it could be the case. It's not beyond the power of God's omniscience. There's no logical contradiction involved. So it could have been the case, but but I would tend to think that one of the other solutions I mentioned for where Jesus got his Y chromosome would be the- would, would be more uh, plausible because economically you have to suppose multiple miracles down all those generations. And per Occam's razor, Occam being a monk, you would assume the simpler solution involving fewer miracles. Uh, Jimmy, this uh, weird question from Paul, I believe, is just directly addressed to you personally. Okay. How long did it take to grow your beard and how long is it? Oh, okay. Well, once I started growing it out, it took about a year. Okay. Um, And I let it reach its terminal length, which is the length that hair on our body grows until it stops. Mm -hmm. And then once it reaches that length, it uh, hair may fall out of the follicle and then it starts growing a new one. So that's why our eyebrows don't just grow forever. Speak for yourself, Jimmy. (laughs) (laughs) The work I have Um, to do on these eyebrows. Yeah. Well, um, so it took about a year once I started growing it out. I mean, I had a beard before, but I was cutting it. And so I stopped Mm -hmm. cutting it. Yeah. About a year in terms of how long it is. It depends on how you measure it. If you measured like from the top of my sideburns to the bottom of my beard, you get one length but um but it would be different hairs yeah you know different oh whiskers. right right it'd be one and beard so, yeah um if though it'd be one beard but it, it also depends on do you 
do you straighten oh, it, it out yes. or do you let it curl up because my beard is somewhat curly? And so if you measured from the bottom of my chin, mm-hmm. so underneath my chin to the end of the currently longest whisker, it would be about a foot, maybe a little more. And from that, you can infer it. my beard grows about one inch a month, which is pretty oh. typical for guys. I imagine you have probably done some research on this, but is there anybody that has like the world record beard or how long is like a really long beard? I'm guessing a foot was pretty is pretty good. There are longer ones. It depends on your on your genetics and your health and age and things like that. Obviously age, because before a certain age, your beard is like millimeters in length. I didn't have a beard when I was a baby. Well, you did. It just wasn't it wasn't visible as such. You learn something every day. Um, uh, Ryan asks this, Jimmy, mm-hmm. apparently there is a non-theistic movement called Jediism mm-hmm. that is based on what the Jedi follow. Would it be okay for Catholics to be part of this, even though the quote real life Jedi might not be too quick to admit that, uh, they are being, that they're doing role playing. So it's going to depend on, and this kind of goes back to our first question, which is kind of becoming the wellspring of a lot of principles that we're using here um, about the actors oh, right. and what yeah. they were intending to do. Yeah. So if you, it, it depends on how you interpret Jediism. If you interpret it as a real religion, then Catholics should not have anything to do with it. If you interpret it as a game you're playing, then you could play a Jedi just like actors in a movie could play a Jedi. You're just not in a movie. You know, you're just doing right. it for fun. You're not yeah. taking it seriously. If you are in a situation where you are not taking it seriously, so you are not doing anything wrong, you're just play acting, but other people around you are taking it more seriously, Mm. then you have a question of what degree of responsibility do I have for interacting with these people in a way where they may think I'm taking this seriously and they may be being reinforced in their taking it seriously. And that's a judgment call. It's going to depend on how seriously they're taking it, how many they are, in the group compared to um, how many people are not taking it seriously and what else you're doing to compensate. Like you could say, I'm going to evangelize these Jedi people. I'm going to become part of their group Um, and I'm going to say, oh yeah, of course guys, this is all fun. And of course we don't mean it. Right. Yeah. And here's some information about actual religion that you might find helpful. Yeah. And so it's going to depend on all of those factors. And it's going to be a a matter of practical judgment, depending on all of those circumstances. Um, so this is a real thing, though. People, oh, yeah. 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 Just, a number of years ago in Australia, like some s- surprising percentage of um, people on the national um Census declared Jedi is their religion. Yeah. And there are, of course, loads of Star Wars groups around places that where people play Jedi and stuff like that. Um, and there was there's like a Jedi temple that's registered in Texas really? as a nonprofit organization. And there was in Turkey, there was a petition started to build a Jedi temple on a college campus that was kind of a reaction to a previous petition to build a mosque on the college campus. Oh, yes. So yeah. this is a, yeah, I can see that some of this could just all be in fun, but some of it has a little bit of an undertone yeah. to it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, Leslie asks a very succinct question. Zombies. Can they be saved? Depends on how you define a zombie. Um, Zombies are understood in multiple different ways, and I'll cover them all when I finally come out with the Secret Vatican Zombie Hunters handbook. Which I am so looking forward to. That's going to be a hit. (laughs) That book is going to be a hit. I I think it will be. Yeah. Um, In terms, so let's start with the most real world example of a zombie. Um, There are claims that like down in Haiti, uh, there are people who, you know, I forget the term for them, maybe Hungun, but I forget. Um, there are people who are basically like medicine men, folk practitioners, who can give somebody a drug that will make them fall into a coma. And when they come out of the coma, they're kind of brain damaged and suggestible. 
Okay. Okay. Yes. So if that's what's happening, we could call that a pharmacological zombie because it's just a normal person who has not really died, but who is has fallen under the influence of a drug such that they display zombie-like behavior. Um, in that case, absolutely, they can be saved. Now, the question is going to be... Um, how do you how do you help them achieve that? Depending on the amount of brain damage they have, uh, you yeah. may or may not be able to evangelize them. Depending on the disposition of their will before they receive the zombie drug, you may or may not be able to baptize them. Um, but oh, in principle, right. it's possible for them to be saved. Then let's go to like the complete other extreme and say, OK, a zombie is um, literally a dead body. Mm -hmm. that has been reanimated through natural or supernatural means. So like there are there's a virus or there's a mechanical system or there's a, a, a demon that is animating this dead body. Well, in that case, no, because there's no human soul there to be saved. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, a zombie wouldn't be either saved or lost because there's no human soul there. Uh, OK, so uh, Seamus. Asks the following then. Seamus or Seamus? Seamus. Is it Seamus? I don't know. How if this... it's spelled S-E-A-M-U-S. S-I-M-A-S. -S. Oh, okay. Seamus then. Okay, I guess. Um, also, mm -hmm. I like <laughs> the zombie question. People are very succinct. Mm -hmm. Also, are zombies biblical? It's going to depend on what you mean by biblical. <laughs> I uh, love this. this is, well, uh, this is typical Thomas Aquinas. You've got to distinguish your terms <laughs> yeah, first. Right. So if by biblical you mean, is it something that we find positive evidence for in the Bible? The answer is no. We do have people coming back who die and come back from the dead in the Bible, Jesus being the most famous example, but there are others too. Uh, but they are not returned to a state where they have an impaired existence. They are either returned to a normal existence like Lazarus okay. or to an elevated existence like Jesus, okay. where he has these supernatural, you know, he's yeah. final glorified resurrection type form and abilities. Uh, so a zombie, even if you understand a zombie to be a reanimated corpse, it doesn't return to a normal level of existence. It returns to a subnormal level of existence. And in and so we don't find any evidence for that happening in the Bible. On the other hand, if you mean, um, on, are they biblical in the sense of would the Bible prevent there from being zombies? Oh, OK. Yeah. Then, no, the Bible also doesn't prevent there from being zombies. You could hypothetically create a pharmacological zombie where you give someone a drug, it puts them in a coma. When they come out of the coma, they are brain damaged and suggestible. You could do that. You could take a corpse and assuming it's a sufficiently fresh corpse, you could reanimate it. With some kind of, say, mechanical system, maybe long distance electrodes shot into the pineal pituitary gland of the brain, a reference to Plan 9 from outer space. <laughs> OK, because that's the center. That's what Plan 9 is. Back to what is the reanimation of the Earth dead <laughs> yeah. through that means. Um, so you you you, you know, hypothetically, you could use a mechanical system to reanimate a corpse. And there might be other ways of doing it. So they're they're not biblical in the sense of the Bible doesn't give us any positive evidence for them, but they're also not unbiblical in the sense that the Bible doesn't prevent them from uh, say that they definitely can't exist in any form. All right. Uh, it is weird questions uh, with Jimmy Aiken today. Thank you for those very succinct, uh, but enlightening uh, zombie succinct is questions. Good. Succinct is kind of, <laughs> yes, it's one of your favorite virtues. Be, be brief. <laughs> yes. Um, did you ever see the Bob Hope zombie routine? I haven't zombie seen bit? that one. I've seen a lot of Bob Hope routines, but not that one. I'll show it to you the break and then you can tell me whether I can mention it on the air. It's from a movie. It's uh, mm -hmm. it, it, and if you just type Bob Hope zombie. Oh, Bob the, Hope. I was thinking Bob Newhart. No. I've also seen a lot of Bob Hope routines. Uh, Carlos asks uh, this. Uh, Does tradition give us any idea of what happened to the saints that rose from the grave and went into the holy city after the crucifixion of our Lord? So this is something that is mentioned in Matthew 27, verses 51 to 53. And Matthew gives us a little bit of information about this. And there's 
almost nothing about this in later tradition. I have only been able to find one church father that discusses it, and that's um, um, uh, Apollinaris of Laodicea, who lived in the 300s. He was a bishop in Laodicea in Turkey. Okay. And he says this, the raising up of the saints' bodies was announcing that the death of Christ was actually the cause of life. They certainly were not made visible prior to the Lord's resurrection. And that's actually something a lot of modern scholars have said based on the way Matthew phrases it. Yeah. It's like they they didn't um they didn't make themselves manifest to the people in Jerusalem until after the resurrection. Okay. So that's actually some modern scholars will support that. But anyway, Apollinaris says uh, they certainly were not made visible prior to the Lord's resurrection, since it was necessary that the resurrection of the Savior first be made known. Then those who through him, then those raised through him were seen. It is plain. Now, this is another big question. Did they have glorified bodies? Did they Mm -hmm. were they assumed into heaven or did they die again? Right. And they might have just, you know, gone straight back to the tomb. And presumably like when Lazarus is raised, he lives out a normal life and then eventually dies. These guys may have gone like straight back to the tomb and laid down. Mm -hmm. So that's an option. According to Apollinaris, then though uh, it is plain that they have died again. Uh, So he doesn't think they were assumed into heaven. Uh, It is plain that they have died again, having risen from the dead in order to be a sign. For it was not possible for only some of the firstborn from the dead to be raised to the life of the age to come. But the remainder uh, must be raised in the same manner. So he thinks that they they died again, either quickly or at some couldn't have been too long or we'd have more of a record of them. Yeah. But uh, he's unfortunately he's in the three hundreds mm-hmm. and we don't have intervening information about this tradition. If only we had Papias's exposition of the Logia of the Lord, we might. Oh, really? It's in there. Well, it oh, might because be it might have because more of stuff. what right. the nature of that work is. But um, it, it's a commentary on the traditions in the Gospels, it seems. And the earliest right, commentary. commentary. Yeah. So we, we might if we had that, but unfortunately we don't. And since Apollinaris is over 200 years later, you can't put a lot of weight in what he says. He's probably deducing. In fact, you look at what he says and he's deducing this stuff. Um, He's saying it can't, Uh, they couldn't have been seen prior to Jesus's resurrection because this, and they must have died again because this. So he's like deducing, he's he's exegeting the text. Right. Okay. Uh, Well, thank you very much for that Uh, question, Carlos. Uh, RJ asks this, Jimmy, what is the real point of masses where pets are blessed? It's going to depend partly on how you understand blessing, but in general terms, it is a uh, uh, when you have animals blessed and this, you know, is traditional in some situations in the liturgical year. When you have animals blessed, it's basically asking God to help the animal and in particular to help the animal be of use to human beings. Now, historically, it wasn't so much pets. It was livestock because this was how people made their living. They were, yeah. you know, agrarians. And so yeah. they needed their livestock to be healthy and productive and all of that stuff. Right. So, and so it was basically the blessing was an enacted prayer to help the livestock perform their functions well for the for the farmers who raised them in a modern setting where you have people bringing pets more to be blessed it's going to be the same thing to you know help we want this animal to be healthy and we want it to be able to perform its function relative to its owners well which is to provide companionship and pleasure and things like that all right uh thank you for that question rj steven asks um Suppose you took a single cell, excuse me, single celled human embryo. You removed the sex chromosomes from this embryo's DNA and replaced them with chromosomes of the opposite sex. Now the child will grow up to be the opposite sex. What will this person be in the resurrection? The answer to this one is unclear. And it can go in several different directions. On the one hand, you could say, well, uh, God 
meant this person to be one sex, and even though you've surgically altered the person at the genetic level to be of another sex, God's initial intention is going to prevail. Mm -hmm. So when he puts the person's body back together, he's going to fix the genetic damage you caused Mm -hmm. and restore his original intention. On the other hand, um, there's some conceptual question here because sex and chromosomes, even though they are almost always uh, linked, it's not 100%. Mm -hmm. To illustrate that, some species do have different sex chromosomes than we do. Some species do so like some species do not have x and y okay um some of them will have uh a different set of chromosomes that determines gender some species have uh sex determined by things other than their chromosomes like what phase of life they're in black mollies for example switch gender at certain points in their lives black mollies are a kind of fish okay. um Also, uh, it can be determined by like how warm the eggs of the species were when they were incubating Mm -hmm. will determine uh, sex. And so sex can be determined a bunch of different ways. It's not always linked to chromosomes. In humans, it normally is. Okay. But even in humans, there are people who have genetic abnormalities um, where you, I mentioned earlier on the show, some people have XXY. Yeah. Other people have YYX. Some people have just an X. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there are other possibilities in humans. And uh, sometimes even if it's, even if they don't have a genetic abnormality, they may have a physiological abnormality. So they might have the sex chromosomes for one sex, but physiologically, there's something else. And they're the other sex. Right. So because of that, there is some question here. Also, you could say, well, so like I'm Jimmy Aiken. I'm a man. I wouldn't be Jimmy Aiken if I were a woman. No. And so if you take a, a, a zygote, a one celled human, and you switch the chromosomes so that the gender flips, then you could say it's not the same person anymore. You've come up with a new human being uh, that is almost genetically identical to the original human being that you've now killed. Yeah. Um, But uh, it's a new human being. And so you could say at the resurrection, there's going to be two human beings, one genetically identical to the original human and one identical, genetically identical to the one you've now created. So I'd say the answer is undefined, but those are some of the options. And also don't do this. Yeah, don't do it. It's it's wrong. It's wrong because it, and I think sometimes the language can be confusing to people because it says human embryo. Uh, well, it's a, technically not an embryo. It's a zygote at this point. Yeah. And it's a, it's a human in the zygote phase, a human. Like we, you know, we say like a human finger or a human lung or something. And I think sometimes people think, oh, a zygote is like. Mm-hmm. Like that. Or the, linguistically, those sound the same. Well, it and is so, a human zygote. There are other zygotes, like you could have a no, rabbit zygote. Right, right. But I'm talking about what we do linguistically with that is mm-hmm. we can fool ourselves into thinking this is not a full, no, it is a human full person. complete human being. Yeah. Um, and so don't mess with its um, genes, gender, yeah, um, or sex. Yeah. Uh, Nick, uh, next question. In scripture, we read many times that Jesus wept. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we I read that once. Yeah, actually. I, well, it, there's one single verse that in John that just says Jesus wept. It's yeah. the shortest verse in the New Testament. There are maybe other verses that mention it using other terms, though, or in saying it in a different way. OK, yet I can't think of a single instance to read that Jesus laughed. Did he? I would say yes, and I would say that on two lines of evidence, even though there's no verse that say Jesus laughed, but there are a couple of lines of evidence I would appeal to. The first one is we do see Jesus using humor. In fact, there's a whole book called The Humor of of Jesus by a guy named Elton Trueblood. It's a short book, but it, it's it's out there. Um, we do see Jesus using humor. An example, and he a lot of his humor, he uses it when he's talking about, when he's critiquing people who are unspiritual. And so he'll use sarcasm, yeah. which is a form of humor when he like calls people blind guides. Yeah. You know, the idea of a blind person leading a blind person 
is yeah. it contains an element of humor. It's a kind of negative humor, but it is humor. I've always liked the line whitewashed sepulchers. Yeah, whitewashed sepulchers. Yeah. So you you have Jesus using humor, which is the an appropriate response to his laughter. And so I would say that's evidence that Jesus gets and appreciates humor, yeah. even though we're, it's not mentioned that he laughed. The second thing is humor is a human un- and laughter is a human universal. It is wired into our genetic nature. Mm-hmm. And I had a vivid illustration of this a number of years ago. I was friends with a family and a, one of the members of the family was a girl who was deaf. And she was at the time like two, three years old, I think three years old. And she was born deaf. So she had never heard laughter Mm -hmm. and she would go around the house playing with her sibs, laughing her head off, even though she could not hear the sound of her own laughter. She could not have learned this behavior by listening to other people. It's It's innate. Yeah. Okay. So Jesus, since he had a human nature, he laughed. Yeah. So he's like us in all things. Yeah. What's the line? He's like us in all things except Except sin. sin. Yeah. All right. Uh, It's not a sin to laugh at funny stuff. No, it is not. It is. uh, Well, I don't know where I was going to go with that. Uh, How'd they keep time? You want a little bit more about laughter? Because it's apparently it's written. It's not only written into our nature. It's apparently written into the nature of other creatures as well, including our most our closest genetic relatives, chimpanzees. They laugh. They have a behavior. It doesn't sound quite like human laughter, but it's a kind of panting. It's this pant pant. Oh, I, sound. Yeah, I remember you told me and this one time. They yeah. do it when they're playing to signal, I'm not serious. I'm having fun. I'm not really fighting with you. That's part of what laughter does. It signals, I'm having fun. I'm not trying to attack you. Is it a sign of paranoia that I now think chimpanzees are laughing at me now that you told me that? <laughs> <laughs> have you been wrestling with them? <laughs> no, I'm not that dumb. Uh, Jimmy, Good, they're stronger than we are. Oh, I know. Uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Aiken has been our guest. Jimmy's latest book is Teaching with Authority, How to Cut Through Doctrine. We'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Lena S., Peter M., John O., Gregory K., and Captain Natron. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at AaronV.com. Okay, Jimmy, so what's the subject of our next episode? Our next two episodes are going to be devoted to the psychic ability referred to as remote viewing. In episode 102, we're going to be talking about how remote viewing got started and how it led to the government having a psychic spying program known as Stargate. And then in 103, we're going to be looking at what does the evidence say about whether remote viewing actually works. Excellent. So be sure to send us your feedback by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. Send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. Until next time, Jimmy Akin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest.